Grace and mercy and peace to you this afternoon from God our Father and from Jesus our Savior. Key word today is the word hypocrite, which has a really bad flavor, doesn't it? Who wants to be a hypocrite? But if you go back, it's a Greek word and it's not bad at all. What the word hypocrite means is somebody who's an actor, like this guy. Ring a bell for you? Uh, he won the Oscar last year for Best Actor. I, I don't know, can I pronounce his name? Uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, so he's done lots of movies. Two years ago, in, in 2018, he played the role of Jesus in a movie. Uh, but that's not the one that won him Best Actor. The one that won him Best Actor is he was the title character in the movie Joker. I haven't actually watched it yet. I don't know if you have. But the character they played in Joker, it's... This, this mentally ill man who's pushed over the edge into becoming the just diabolically evil character in the Batman movies. And the point of acting is he's not either one of those. Is he as good as Jesus Christ? <laughs> not even close. Is, is he personally as twisted and evil as the character in Joker? No, that's not who he is. He's an actor and a really good one, which means... You can throw any part at him you want, and he'll probably play it so convincingly that you'll think it's the real deal. For the Joker part, he lost like 52 pounds in three months, so he could be skinny and emaciated like the character was supposed to be. That's how far he got into playing the role. Now, that's what hypocrite means in Greek. Not that it's bad to be an actor. I think some of you probably love being in drama and productions like that. But the Bible does use that word for a spiritual condition that's horrible. Uh, and it's like this, that you're acting on the outside that what's going on inside your heart is different than what's happening on the, on the outside. And there are really a couple different ways that can happen. Here's the way I would put it in a chart. So if you've got you on the inside and you on the outside and you're either good or evil, in each of those. There are two that are not hypocrisy. Those are the ones with X's. So if you are good on the inside and you are good on the outside, you're not being a hypocrite. If you are evil on the inside and you're evil on the outside, that's not a good thing, but still, you're not being a hypocrite. There is a trueness and authenticity between what's inside and outside in your life. Hypocrite would be those other two categories. The one mark number one would be if you claim to be good on the out inside, but make it clear on the outside that you're actually evil, there's a disconnect between what you say you are versus what you truly are on the outside. That's the one that I hear most often, and I did a Google search on the word. Google does these charts. You can pick any word in the English language and see whether it's being used more or less than it used to be. This is their chart for the word hypocrite. Uh, hypocrite has been used more now in the last couple decades than it was the last hundred years. And in a way, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, it looks to me like that graph takes off just about the same time as social media and just about the same time my generation, millennials, are starting to be more active in what they write and say. I've been told, and I think to some extent this is true, that younger generations have a very keen sense for picking out if somebody's fake or not. And with social media now, it seems like it's everybody's duty to point that out to the whole world. You say you're not a racist, but you said something that was racist. You hypocrite, let me tell everybody about it. You say that you're not a liar, but I just caught you in a liar. You hypocrite, let me post on Facebook or wherever it is about the lie that you told. People have been more and more lately interested in what it means to be a a hypocrite. It, from what I hear, often it's, it's that category number one. People are claiming to be good on the inside, but people are quick to say, no, you're not living up on the outside to what you say is good and, and right. But that's not really the way the Bible uses the term or the way that Jesus did. Look through the Bible and pretty consistently it's number two. A hypocrite is somebody who is actually very good on the outside, but evil, evil within. That the good on the outside is only a facade for something that's horrible uh, that maybe nobody knows anything about. In fact, using that, that number two definition of hypocrite, 
I, should I say the best hypocrite? It, the worst hypocrites would be those where it's actually invisible. That nobody in the whole world is aware of their hypocrisy. So total and complete is it, the disconnect, that what they are on the outside is so good and completely hides what's evil deep in the heart. Jesus talked about many of the Pharisees of his day being like that, and he compared them, he used a number of different comparisons. One, he said, is you're like walking through a cemetery. On the outside, in the cemetery, everything is perfectly well kept. The stones are pure white. They're all lined up. The grass is trimmed. It looks like everything is is perfect, but inside there is death. Inside there are rotting bones. That's what it's like, Jesus says, for a true hypocrite. Somebody on the outside where everything looks good, but in their heart is evil and death and rot. And that's where Caiaphas comes in tonight. You heard about him, the, the high priest. I'm not going to read it all again. Here are the verses that really get at the heart of it. Mark chapter 14, verses 63 and 64. The high priest, Caiaphas, tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. The theme on these Wednesdays is things people did with their hands that show what's going on in their heart. The thing that Caiaphas did was he took his robes and he ripped them. Which in the culture back then was a way of showing total surprise, and not just surprise, shock and offense kind of the equivalent of Twitter blowing up at hypocrisy, Uh, showing shock and especially shock that you would do something evil against God. And the reason that Caiaphas is showing that outward outrage is because Jesus has just said that he's the one who's going to be coming back on the clouds to judge the world. Blasphemy, Caiaphas shouts, and he condemns Jesus to death. Are you seeing the hypocrisy there? Uh, it might help if you know more of the backstory. Caiaphas and the Jewish leaders had been keeping an eye on Jesus throughout his ministry. Uh, and early on, there was some talk of, is this a guy we need to get rid of? Initially, it wasn't that serious, but over the three years of Jesus' ministry, if you read the Gospels, you see that growing and growing. This is a, a growing concern for Caiaphas is this might be a man we have to get rid of. And then, Jesus did something truly horrible. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was horrible for Caiaphas because now even more people were going to Jesus and believing in him. That was only a few weeks before Holy Week and what we're reading about here. Uh, And and, and when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Caiaphas' reaction was to call an emergency meeting of the Sanhedrin. And the topic for discussion that day was, it's either him or us. If Jesus continues to live, the Romans are going to come and take away our position of power and the temple and our standing as the Jewish people. And Caiaphas stood up there as the leader and said, you're not thinking straight. He needs to die for the good of the people. It's better for one man to to perish than for all of us to. Uh, John, the, the gospel writer records that, says that actually was a prophecy that came true. Was it, in fact, better for one man to die for the sins of the whole world, including ours? It was. But Caiaphas was thinking chiefly of himself. It's better to condemn Jesus to death than for us to lose our power by having more people follow him. And so, serious plans were now laid to condemn Jesus and to kill him. And it all came together that Thursday night into Friday morning, when Judas, Jesus' disciple, betrayed him, Caiaphas was in on giving him 30 pieces of silver uh, to, to deny or to betray his Savior. Uh, but that night, things didn't go as Caiaphas had hoped. They've got this trial going in the middle of the night, which was illegal, but they can't make any charges stick because, as Caiaphas knows full well, the man that they're charging is innocent. 
there's nothing in him that deserves death. But Caiaphas has it in his mind that Jesus has to die, and so they've got to find a charge that's going to stick. Because nobody else could do it, Caiaphas took over the prosecution himself, and the question that he had been working on that he thought could nail Jesus is, are you the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am, and you will see me coming on the clouds to judge the world. And that's where this verse comes in. Caiaphas takes his hands and rips his robes and exclaims, we don't need any other witnesses. We've found him. He is guilty of blasphemy, isn't he? And that is the moment when they condemn Jesus to death. And are you seeing the hypocrisy now? On the outside is this moral outrage at Jesus, but on the inside, he must have been doing a happy dance because that's exactly what he was hoping to have happen. It's exactly what he wanted was to condemn Jesus even though he knew Jesus was, was innocent. And so of all the ironies of Jesus' passion, how about this one? God got condemned for being God. The people who condemned God thought that they were, or at least put on the outward show of being the ones who were righteous and just, of being concerned about sin, while at the same time sinning against their Savior and spitting in his face and sending him away to be, to be crucified. What, what a graveyard. Outwardly good, inwardly dead. What an example of hypocrisy. But as we go through these Wednesdays, it's not just a character sketch of somebody from then. It's also hopefully a chance for us to look at our own hearts and to look today for that word, that hypocrisy. Um, is that in you? Is that in, in me? Uh, the reality is, if I'm really good at it, you won't even know. If you're really good at it, I won't even know because the way the Bible describes hypocrisy is not you got caught saying a word that everybody else was offended at. It's when you do everything right on the outside, yet your heart is actually, actually wrong. Uh, there was once as a pastor where I reached out to a couple with an email. Uh, I was heartfelt, honest, and I, I said, it's been wonderful to be with you. I, I had spent quite a bit of time with them. Uh, to see you and your family, I, I wish there were more families like yours in the church. And wouldn't you know, <laughs> uh, within two days I got the email back, actually our marriage is falling apart uh, and one of us is leaving with the kids and it's been horrible for a long time. And it, well, Am I just totally blind? I, maybe I am. I, I think sometimes I am fairly naive about assuming things that aren't really real but how easy isn't it for for even us as christians to have it look like everything is is right on the outside when there is sin within in our relationships even in our relationships with with god you probably know this is one of the charges i hear from people outside the christian church that the christian church is full of people who claim to be a lot better than they really are Christians are people who put on a good show, but they're just as dirty and sinful as everybody else. Why would I want to be part of the, of the Christian church? And as you dig in more into what is it that makes, makes hypocrisy what it is, uh, it's really a fear there. There's a fear that if I really would share what I'm like and who I am, that then nobody really would, would love me. If I really would show who I am in my marriage, would my spouse even want to be with me anymore? If I really showed who I am at work, would they actually let me keep my job? If I really showed who I am in the Christian church, could I even be considered a member there? Or even before God... Uh, I suppose if God really knew who I am, would God really love me? And so a hypocrite, that, that outside veneer of goodness, 
uh, can be th the last ditch effort to try to keep everything together that I don't want everything to fall apart so on the outside I will try my hardest to make everything look perfect and good. But that is so hard and most people give themselves away because that is so, it's next to impossible to be able to maintain that and never crack. You maybe have heard the saying, you can fool all the people sometime, you can fool some of the people all the time, but you can never fool all the people all the time. And if I'd add one about God, you can never ever fool God. So that in the end, if there's this disconnect between what's on the inside and what's on the outside, if you're living a life that on the outside really is a lie, the only one you're really deceiving is, is yourself. The Bible says that. So this is 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, if we would ever deceive ourselves into thinking that everything is perfectly fine, there's no sin in our lives, we'd be, we'd be lying, we'd be, we'd be hypocrites. And so what's the answer? Uh, John gives it there, but before we go to the real answer, there are a couple you've got to throw out, right? Uh, is fixing hypocrisy just a matter of fixing what's on the outside in your life that's not going to really get to the bottom of it. Even though that's what I see on social media. That, uh, so if the problem is somebody drops a word they never should have said, well, a lot of people think the solution is you just got to be more careful and more cautious about what you say. Uh, if it's, I don't want to do that thing that would be hypocrisy, it, it'd be fairly easy to say, I'm just going to watch out that I don't do this, I don't say that, but... If the evil really is inside, it's got to go deeper. Another answer I hear some people going toward is to say, well, I'm going to be authentic. And if I feel anger on the inside, I'll show anger on the outside. If I feel sexual temptation on the outside, inside, I'm going to give into that on the outside. You name it, that I'm not going to be a hypocrite. If I feel on the inside, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But how horrible would that be for ourselves and our world if we just give into the evil that's in our our sinful nature. It can't be those. John says this is the answer when there is a disconnect between what's inside of us and what's on the outside. It's to turn to God and find forgiveness in him. God's the only one who's able to come and change our, change our hearts. And what about that fear of if someone knew your heart, would they really love you? Think about that for a moment with God. God says that he, he loves you. Is that true? Does God only love the Facebook carefully curated version of you where it's all your best photos and you threw out the 99 that weren't quite right? No, God's love is not limited just to that outward profile of you. Does God only love you on your best days and not on your worst? Uh, no. God loves you for who you are, not before you've shaped up and changed. It's not that you've got to get rid of that evil on the inside before God would think of loving you. In fact, it's the opposite. God looked into a world of sinners, and he's not like us. He actually can see into the heart of each one of us. He knows the evil that's inside. But knowing full well what he was getting into, God said, I'm still going to love them. I'm going to come into the world and save and save them. So even if you would lay bare your worst evil things that you haven't shared with anybody else, would God still love and forgive you? He would and he, he does. He already has done that in Jesus Christ. And I'd hope too then that that'd be true of others in your life too. That not saying today you just go out and say, let me tell you the very worst things about myself to everybody around you, but if you would open up to your spouse about things in your marriage where you know you've done what's wrong, would your spouse love and forgive you? I hope, as Christians, we would, right? If in the church 
we've done things that are going to hurt each other. Do we have to have some kind of outward veneer that everything is fine when it's not? I hope we could love and forgive each other either, e- too. And this is something you see throughout the Bible is people who in the grace of God have found, found a way to break out of hypocrisy and to be a child of God forgiven on the inside and on the, on the outside. Problem is you can't go to Caiaphas for that. He's a great example of outward hypocrisy but not of somebody who found forgiveness in Christ. As far as I know, he held on to that outward shell of goodness the rest of his life. He was told by eyewitnesses that Jesus was alive, but he didn't believe it. Book of Acts, he kept fighting against the Christian church. For all I know, he lived every day and died uh, died a hypocrite. But let me give you another example of somebody else who was among the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time who did turn to Jesus, who did give away that outward shell of goodness and found forgiveness. The the best example I can think of is the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, he writes about the change in his own heart from being a hypocrite to being someone who knew he was forgiven in the righteousness of Jesus. And then Paul gave an example of what that looks like in his life. So as we close this afternoon, Let me just turn there and read you straight from what he wrote. I want you to look for this. Look for what was it that Paul had built up in his life, this outward appearance of goodness. Look for how he says he found something different in the righteousness of Jesus. And then finally, how did that shape the way Paul then lived? So this is Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 4. Apostle Paul said, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. How about that for good appearances on the outside? Paul goes on. But, whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul found there was something better than trying to hide his sinfulness with righteousness on the outside. He instead found the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his Savior. To know Christ is what he now held inside, and that then changed the way he lived. Again, the word hypocrite means being an actor uh, in the bad way of your life of faith is only an acting on the outside that isn't really, isn't really you. So now, listen, this is the last verse. This is what Paul said in 3 verse 16. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. That for us who know the love of Jesus, who have been forgiven, it doesn't have to be acting. It's not trying to be something that you're not. Instead, it's actually living more and more to be what God has made you in Christ. What have you already attained? You're God's child through baptism. You're an heir of heaven. Paul says, let's now every day live up to that. Not being fake on the outside, not acting, but really truly knowing Christ and then living Christ being found in him. Amen.
Now is when we would be gathering the offerings. It's, it's not just about the money you put in the, the plates or online. It's, the question is, how do you give yourself back to God? Not as some kind of actor, but the real thing that God gets, gets all of you inside and out.